mark in the slanting rays of the afternoon sun, high in the rarefied air on the Rainbow Bridge, somewhere to the southeast of the great Lost Plateau, Venezuela, South America. Jack and Doc are being conducted on the second phase of their return trek to the legendary island in the sky. For two hours now, Jack and Doc, with Jeremiah and Uganda and Saul of Tarsus, have been negotiating the Rainbow Bridge. It is a structure of key stones, arched like a rainbow, with its foot in it on one on each side of a bottomless precipice. The arc of the bridge is four miles, the width of the bridge is ten feet. A ten-foot pathway into the sky, without side railings. That is why Jack was given the rope about the mule's neck to hang on to, and Doc was given the animal's tail. Neither Jeremiah nor Uganda seem to mind the narrowness of the bridge or the breathtaking rise into the air. This is a fine darn way to travel, hanging on to the end of a donkey's tail. Oh, for plenty of years now, it's always constant and diminishing with this curtain over the bridge. If I were to give you hold of that tail and start in the broad road, you get to there, so don't you worry about that. Yeah, he, uh, he ain't liable to let go with one or both of them high legs. And that's why he's on the bridge. <laughs> oh, no, sir. If I don't look at the respect for the rainbow bridge, just like the rest of us. But, guys, uh, I wouldn't come up behind him next when he's in the bridge. Well, then, Father, if it's too high, well, I'll hold the bridge to the top of the arm. Halfway up. Yeah, but I'm not going to let you down here. Up one side and down the other. Well, personally, I ain't a looking. I'm keeping my eyes right straight ahead on Saul of Tarsus' pack saddle. You should be hearing the music any time now. Music? Yes. Just before we reach the top of the arm. From someplace out there comes beautiful music. No, it's not real music. Oh, no. It's just very cold. Hey, hey, say someone were letting his fingers fall gently on the strings of a heart. But that's silly. How can anybody be making music up here? <laughs> Doesn't the sky above and space a couple of miles deep below? Doc, oh, you really are a young soul, aren't you? Hey, would you, you stop calling me a soul? I'm just a plain blood and bone Texas boy. Oh, yes, it is the incarnation of Christ. But fundamentally, you are a soul or a spirit of the universe. Oh, yes, and you are a very young spirit. Oh, listen, listen, stop a moment. You hear it, don't you? Yeah. You get it, Jack? Yeah. Oh, it reminds me of that, huh? Well, what? The sound of music we heard when we went behind the Mile High Waterfall on the other side of the Lost Plateau. Hey, that's exactly what it sounds like. You have been behind the curtain of water, which leads to the stairs of the sun? Of course we were. Last time we was up on the plateau. You have been off. But I do not know that. Jeremiah, you do not tell me. No, didn't I know <laughs> It must have slipped my mind. So that is why you are being allowed to cross the rainbow bridge. Because already you have been... Well, then, no, then. Let's get along with this. We can't stand here all day. Yes, well, come along with this, old daughter. Let's get that ship. Come along with you. It just looks like Jeremiah don't want you asking no questions, your daughter. You see? I, too, am a young soul. I do not control my tongue. I am still a patient. Yeah, a young soul of 17. Oh, no. I am 17 years in this newest reincarnation. That does not measure the age of a soul. A million years is young for a soul. If you were just reincarnated 17 years ago, who was you before that? Well, all those who know, I do not. I have not arrived at that state of perfection yet. Uh-huh. Well, it's all very interesting, but I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> You're a wonderful doctor. Hey, uh, how long do we keep here in that heart, sir? Until we begin to decide on the other side. And here we come to the top of the arc. Ah, well, I should think so. I'm getting sort of leg weary climbing. It shouldn't take us so long to make the descent. Well, no, it's no way of slowing down. Those cobblestones drop the way they stay in the world for a decade to find a footing on them. So the stars are safe with nice, they slow and easy. Well, anyway, we started down, and it's a change. Now, what kind of country can we expect uh, once we get out off the street? Well, this volcanic rock, underground rivers, not a blade of grass, not a blade of a tree. Hey, now. 
Somewhere to the southeast of the Great Lost Plateau, Venezuela, South America. 
Little Rosie Chick's hermit, Jeremiah and his new stall of charges, are leading the way along the rocky precipice toward the great really rock pile which hangs precariously on the chasm ledge and which is the monastery of San Felipe. Its ghostly appearance, abetted by the pitch torches flaring from the rough rock battlements, creates more of a picture of an inferno rather than an approach to monastic practice. Suddenly the party turns into a stone paved courtyard. This paint has shiny place we came before. What sort of a monastic order is this, Uganda? I've never asked, and it has never been Catholic. Does it not? It certainly isn't Catholic or Buddhist or Tibetan order. Look, he up out the dim walls. Flag. This is going to be. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I give
San Felipe, somewhere in the southeast of the great lost plateau, Venezuela, South America. When we the party entered the monastery proper, Jack and Doc were separated. Doc was to follow a guide who led him into a bare stone cell, fed him, gave him a swatch of straw and a blanket to lie on, and then left Doc to himself. No one came near him. So after a period of restlessness, he lay down and went to sleep. At three o'clock in the morning, a cowled, robed figure entered the cell, barely silhouetted in the wavering light of a single candle flame in the hands of his attendant. The figure bent and touched the sleeping Doc gently on the shoulder. Doc came awake and up into sitting position, all in one instant. Huh? What is it? Be not disturbed, my son. I am come only to speak with you. The heck of a time for talking. Well, what time is it in here? It is three o'clock as you tell time. Am I supposed to know who you are? I am one of those who must pass judgment upon you before you will be allowed to go further. You don't pass judgment on me? That is why I am here. For judgment for what? I ain't done nothing. No, you misunderstand. Father, I am to pass judgment on your qualifications or capabilities. Uh Huh? I have found that most people find a great deal of satisfaction in discussing themselves with someone who will listen. Oh, yeah, I like to talk about myself. Who don't? Anyway, the part of myself I don't mind showing... Like, I don't care if you know I'm a pretty darn good private detective. And, uh, before that, me and Jack is kind of soldiers of fortune. We done some fighting down here in South America and a couple of revolutions. We fought with that there Christian Chinese general in China before the big fracas busted out. And then we joined up with General John Kotschek and fought Jacks for almost a year while the rest of the world is trying to make up its mind whether to get in or not. Uh, uh, that's the kind of stuff you're interested in? No, oh, you misunderstand your history is colorful, and at another time I would like to hear more of it. But now I should like to know some personal things about you. Mr. Long, are you married? Married? Me? You have not? Uh-uh, not me. Have you ever been? Never. Have you any attachments where women are concerned at the moment? Oh, hey, now. Do you mind so much answering such questions? Oh, no, except they make me feel kind of silly. About this attachment? Well, I... I know plenty of girls back up in Hollywood. You are in no way obligated to any of them or emotionally attached? Uh Uh-uh, just good friends. Have you any other attachments or obligations which would prevent you from uh, cutting yourself off from the past? At least temporarily. Cutting myself off from the past? You mean like, by that, would I be willing to, for instance, stay down here in this neck of woods for the rest of my life? Is, is that what you're getting at? Before you accepted this assignment, you were rewarded with a consideration. Oh, I'll say it was a consideration. A leather bag full of the kind of stuff you'd expect to find in Captain Kidd's treasure chair. Exactly. Would you be averse to accumulating a great deal more of such a treasure? Well, now you talk about something I can understand. Only there's just one thing I want to ask about. Well... Why do you bring me up here and talk to me alone? Why don't you make the proposition in front of Jack, too? Because you alone will be allowed to participate in what I am offering. Then it's out. Uh, I must have misunderstood you. No, you didn't. If Jack ain't in on this, too, then let's do it. I don't believe you understand what I'm talking about. There's a great treasure of precious metals and stones which, according to legend, were lost when the Spanish came to the Americas. They were not lost. They were taken into protective custody by those who are now interested in you. Hey, the Spanish come over here hundreds of years ago. Yes, that is true. Then how could those who hid the treasure be interested in me? They'd be dead and turned back to earth by this time. I do not speak of individuals. I speak of a race of people, a way of life, an order of existence so much older than anything your ancient history books ever dreamed of, that there is no comparison. You sound like your gun. What did you say? Well, I say you sound like that little nature girl, your gun. What do you know of your gun? Well, she's been traveling with us the last three days. We picked her up in that San Philip out of Papa Forest, and she's been with us off and on her fence. Why, did you know her? She came to this place with you? Yeah, yeah, she's down in them cells with Jack and Jeremiah. I don't know. 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 Huh? Hey, hey, well, where's he going? I am sending him to bring the girl to Uganda. Well, you seem to be awfully darn interested in her. Who is she in there? This is not a question either to be asked nor answered. You folks sure do like your mysteries, don't you? To return to our discussion, those who are interested in you also are the custodians of the great treasury of gold and jewels. If you are willing to cut yourself off from all ties, all interests which have been yours until now, if you are willing to accept instead... That which is in store for you, you will be rewarded with wealth beyond average. What wealth beyond average? 
You will be a rich man until the end of your days. Nothing will be beyond your want or desire. You know what you're doing, Frank. You're appealing to the Texas boy. You're making my mouth water like a hound dog looking to put a house steak in the eye. In fact, if you were to sprout a couple of horns and bust out with cloven hooves, I'd say hi, you Satan, and wouldn't be the least bit surprised. Perhaps you would like to come with me and see some of this great treasury for yourself? Uh uh-uh, not me. You will never have another opportunity. It don't make no matter. If you can't cut Jack in on the deal, I ain't interested. Here, hold out your hand. Huh? Hey. Diamonds. Rubies and emeralds. Hey. What am I supposed to do with these? Keep them with you the rest of the night. Sleep with them and think over what we have to offer. The heck with that. Take them back. Here. You mean that? You're doing too, my mean. You ain't bribing me. Oh, here's one fella in the cup of my trousers. Take that, too. Don't be hasty. You still want to reconsider? Hey, look, pal. I'm getting awful sick hearing your voice. If you don't want to bet on the snow, you just keep nagging. Oh, there's old Sanskrit back again. Come on, Rupert. No, 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 no. Huh? What's he saying? Why didn't he bring your gun? She sends word that she prefers to stay where she is. Oh, she does, huh? Okay. What happens now? You will be permitted to go forward. You have met your test. Test? What test? If you had accepted my offer, or if you had as much as hesitated one instant in refusing it, you would have been turned back. You mean, you mean that was all a lot of hokum? That there wasn't any great treasure? Oh, yes. I did not tell you a single untruth. Now you may depart on the next leg of your journey. Even now, the mule saw his tosses is loaded with his burden and stands waiting at the outer gate. And if Jack and Jeremiah and you're gone to come too? They will be at the gate almost as soon as you are. But uh, what you're rushing us off in the middle of the night for? Where you're about to go, it doesn't matter. Huh? Trying to talk is that. Go with my attendant. So here we go again. Oh, here we go again. Volcano? Not only see it, but your next 
myself to walk to the room of the critter. I Love a Mystery, written and produced by Cosme Morris, comes to you Monday through Friday. Featuring Russell Forsman as Jack Packard and Jim Bowles as Doc Long. The star of Russell as Uganda, Robert Dryden as Jeremiah the Hermit, and Louis Van Rosen as the monk. And is directed by Mel Bailey. Your announcer has been Ted Melly. at night on one of the lower levels of the western approach to the mile-high Los Plateau somewhere in Venezuela, South America. Since Jack and Doc joined Jeremiah, the little hermit of San Felipe Atabapo, to perform the duty required of them, they have passed through the ironwood forest, crossed over the rainbow bridge, a span ten feet wide and four miles long. They have spent a night at the monastery of the San Felipe monks and have traveled through the cavern of the lost river of Boncaturo and past the boiling underground lava lake of a sleeping volcano. This brought them out on a stone ledge with a great crevasse lying below them and a thousand-foot perpendicular wall above them. From this upper wall hung a net-like spider web of rope, up which the old hermit and the two boys climbed to a tableland, rich and fertile, and seemingly inhabited by wildlife of some ancient world. It was the beginning of the land of prehistoric animal life, Jeremiah informed them. That was this morning. All day they traveled across a friendly prairie land until darkness, when Jeremiah built a fire, and then went into the bushes and presently returned with the freshly killed carcass of a small animal, which looked like a cross between a possum and a kangaroo. Cooked over the campfire, the meat was white and tender and succulent. And now having eaten, the boys are relaxed in front of the embers of the fire. Oh, boy. After what we've been through today, I could just lay my head back in and sleep like a baby. Yeah, there's no reason why you shouldn't, my boys. <laughs> That's what night for. Besides, you boys have done right well. Better than most by a long way. Oh, have, huh? Yep, acted as though you've been doing this sort of thing all your life. Well, we have for a lot of years now. I understand there's quite a war going on in the outside world right now. Oh, amen, brother, amen. I don't go much for wars myself. Bit of an Irishman, I admit, but I, I can't stomach grabbing another man in the middle with a bayonet. Especially somebody I never laid my eyes on before. I don't feel that way. Me and Jack fought Japs over in China four or five years ago with the Chinese Army. Brother, let me tell you, there ain't much anything I wouldn't do to one of them babies after some of the things I've seen. Well, then why aren't you out there fighting them? Jack will have to answer that. Uh, don't answer if you don't want to, Jack. It isn't a matter of wanting to. Just that we've been retained by a special branch of the United States government to do certain jobs for them. They figure we're doing more good where we are. But here you are at the end of the world down in South America. Well, for all you know, this may be our latest government assignment. Oh, you don't tell me. <laughs> well, now, uh, how about bed? I could do with a mighty sleep myself. Say, Jeremiah, tell me something. Uh, well, whenever you start out that way, you make me think maybe I can't answer you. But go ahead, Jack, go ahead. This thousand-foot level plateau we're on now, the animals on it are distinctly of some ancient period in history. That's right. Yes, sir, no doubt. And yet they're not anything like the animals we saw up on the great plateau itself. True, true. Well, I've been wondering if there's any design to this. I mean, in different places, we seem to find a different period in the history of animal life. And the same thing applies to human life. This afternoon, while we were climbing that spider web up the face of the cliff, we looked across and saw the cliff dwellers. Last time we were up here, we saw the ape man. And in another place, we saw signs of a more advanced man. What I want to know is, what's the meaning of all this up here? Uh, well, now you've really asked something. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of man? My son, I don't know the answer to the meaning of all this up here. Yes, but you seem so familiar. I mean, you must know a great deal. You must know pretty generally why Doc and I are here. Well, as to that, I may and I may not. But to get back to your original question about the animals... You ask if perhaps there's not some design. Well, I think I could answer that for you. Well, go ahead. Hey, before you go into that, answer me something. Well, when are we going to see that baby Uganda again? That I do not know. But as to the life on this plateau, I can tell you this much. The higher intelligence has taken it upon itself to perpetuate and keep to itself plant, animal, and human life in its various forms down through the history of the world. 
You mean there is actually living every stage of man's development from the beginning of the human being? Aye, and the same with animal life and plant life. The table land we've crossed today represents a definite period in the history of the world. Well, we've seen strange animals and plants, but nothing of human life. Somewhere on this plateau is man in some stage of his development. And if I'm not mistaken, man was a very meager creature in this particular era. Well, you don't know what period we're in. No, I do not. But I must tell you that this whole great plateau is one vast museum of natural history. It's being kept for a complete record of the world, when all men shall be ready to receive such information. The higher intelligence uh, doesn't think we're ready yet? Well, now, does it seem likely, with the world outside spending every bit of its time and effort and wealth and intelligence in finding new and more gruesome ways of destroying each other? Yeah, I get your point. But do you think the world's ever going to be any better than it is now? Mm, I can't say as to that. But either it'll grow better or it'll finally destroy us completely. And then what? Well, when the last two civilized people out there in your precious world have finally clawed each other to death... Which we may do. Uh, <laughs> true, true. In which case, the higher intelligence will probably restock the world with some of their finer specimens of mankind and start a newer and better breed of human beings. Very interesting. In other words, this lost plateau may be the place from which a new race of mankind will germinate sometime in the future. All right, as it has done in the past. Uh, what's this? Well, how do you suppose the world was repopulated after the great continent of Atlantis sank beneath the ocean? Who do you suppose gave human life a new start after the continent of Mu was obliterated? Who gave man a new start when the great flood mentioned in the Bible swept human life from the earth? You mean each time the high intelligence up here on this lost plateau planted new humans on the earth? The seed of man, like the seed of any cultivated crop, grows weak and puny and sterile in time and must be renewed from somewhere. Jeremiah... Guess who are these folks in the high place? I have never seen them. Was that embassy come to see us in Hollywood, one of them? Well, I should judge from what you say that he might be some very unimportant wise man on the outer fringe of the high place. No, just sort of an office boy, you might say, huh? <laughs> you might have that. Hey, Jeremiah, huh? look out there on the prairie. Hey, somebody in a white robe. They're coming this way. And praise be now, what? You know who it is? Why, it's that minx of a girl of Uganda. Why, sure, it's Uganda. Hi, honey, where the heck you come from and where you been at? Jeremiah! Jeremiah! Oh, you must help me, you must. Now, now, look here, Uganda. No, 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 you must help me. There is no time to argue. Well, of course we're happy, Uganda. What you want us to do? Come, please, all of you. I will show you the place. Now, just a minute, Uganda. I have my definite no, order. No, 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 Jeremiah. You must come with me. You must. I ask you to. I beg you to. You don't have to beg me. Hey, Doc, will you keep out of this? Oh, if I want to help you, This Uganda, is between I'll... Uganda and Jeremiah. Let them talk. But you haven't told us what it is you want, Uganda. Oh, it was most terrible. There was a great clatter and a great noise in the air, and I looked up, and there was such a bird in the sky as I have never seen before. Airplane? What? Airplane. No such things are allowed over the great plateau. What happened? Well, while I was watching, a great pteranodon came up out of the woods, and it attacked this strange bird. Well, what in the heck is a pteranodon? A giant flying reptile. Yes, and they came together up there, and there seemed to be a great splintering of wood and fire in the sky, and then... Something dropped from the strange bird, and presently a great white cloud appeared. It was like a beautiful white flower suddenly blooming in the sky. A parachute? And hanging from this flower was a man. And when he came down to the earth, he was fair and beautiful, and he was hurt. So I gathered him up in my arms, and I hid him away. Oh, but you can't do that, Jogandi. You know you can't do that. But I have done it. You mean you picked up a full-grown man and, and carried him? I could not take him far, but I have hidden him where he will not be found. And now, please, you must come with me and help me keep him alive. That is forbidden. Uh, just a minute, Jeremiah. From what Uganda says, it sounds to me like this might be a flyer of my own country. If he's hurt, we ought to do what we can for him. He was not supposed to be over the great plateau. Having been brought to earth now, he must be turned over to those in the high place. No! He is mine! I found him! Oh, the high ones are quite right, Uganda. You're a young spirit, a headstrong soul. You have many lives to live before you'll be trusted. He is young! He is handsome! He is mine! What harm can there be in offering him help? If for some reason he must be turned over to some authority later, why can't it be done then? Yeah, what are we standing here arguing for now? Where am I? For me, please? Please take me for an old fool. <laughs> How far is this place? Oh, it is not far at all. 
Over there to the lake where you hear the frogs. Come, please. I show you. Well, I'll walk ahead of you. Uh... Yes, please, but we must hurry. Oh, the fire, but a woman can make trouble. Oh, don't take it so big, Jeremiah. Oh, well, that's and everything. No wonder I've never been allowed to live on the high plains. Always laid around with the nose. The home of the San Felipe Atabapo I am. And the home of the San Felipe Atabapo I'll always be. Well, offhand, I wouldn't say you've had such a hard life of it. <sighs> well, I didn't realize there was a lake this close to our camp. I uh, hid by that ring of bushes. Hey, Jack! Jack, come here quick! Well, uh, what's the matter? Where's your gun, now? Jack, she said, sir, take off your clothes and follow me. There'll be other clothes for you down below. And then she dropped off this here white robe and dived right straight down into that lake. She did what? Yeah, look, here's a robe to prove it. She's been gone two, three minutes now. She must have gone somewhere. Here, Jeremiah, what, what are you doing? Just robing. Are, are you going to dive into the lake? Yeah, and you guys were the ones who were succeed on top in Uganda. Well, all right, now strip off and let's follow her. Well, honest to my grandma. Okay, I'm game if you are, sir. Here go my shoes. Mm. What are we supposed to expect at the bottom of this lake? Yeah, there must be some place fit for human habitation down there. On the bottom of a lake? Sounds like a hangout for a school of mermaids. Now, just where did she die from, Doc? Right where you're standing at, almost exactly. Very well. Follow me, Doc. Well, if your gun and Jeremiah can dive in a pitch black lake in the middle of the night, son, what are we waiting for? <laughs> About this before. Tell you about what, Mary? About Oxidol. Look how beautifully white my clothes are. And I didn't risk breaching them to get them this white either. Mary, don't tell me you're just now discovering how white Oxidol can wash your clothes. Why, I could have told you that long ago. Why didn't somebody tell me about this before? Well, you'll probably ask the same question after you see how Oxidol washes white without bleaching. You see, Oxidol's hustle bubble suds are so lively, so energetic, they lift dirt out. That's why clothes come clean without hard rubbing. Why sheets, towels, shirts, all your white pieces except for some unusual stains come white without bleaching. Sparkling white. And Oxidol is genuinely safe for colored washables and rayons, too. Oxidol gets those reds and blues and yellows so clean they really sparkle. So, so get Oxidol in the orange and blue both a package. Next wash day. Enjoy a wash that's white without bleaching. Materials that go into soap go into making ammunition. Whenever you use soap, remember that. Use no more suds or lather than you really need. Don't waste soap. Listen again tomorrow night for the further adventures of Jack Packard and Doc Long in... The Hermit of San Felipe Atabapo, presented by Oxidol, the soap that gets clothes white without bleaching. And Ivory Soap, 99 and 44, 100% sure.
Oh, 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. Laying here, took off the top of my head. 
Why don't you saw the light off and be done with it? Well, the worst is over now. Taking advantage of a man when he's making light conversation. Well, it's over now. Think about something else. Yeah, yeah, that chance. Hey, uh, by the way, who's that cute girl with you? Uh, what did you call her? Uh, Yoganda? That's right. He's been leaving her out of the conversation, if you please. Plus, he has no hair, aren't you, Jeremiah? You never mind about that. Just tell that young fellow to keep off the subject of Yoganda if he knows what this one is. He didn't mean anything. Well, that's true. I was just interested. I meant nothing offensive. I've got no doubt you're telling the truth. Nevertheless, we let the matter stand as it is. Do Doc and your gun have to go far for wood, Jeremiah? Yes, but I wouldn't know. But it's a part of the world I've never been in before. But it shouldn't be long, I wouldn't Hey, you gander. We're out on the edge of the lake again. Yes, but on the opposite side of the lake. The great cavern, which starts where we dived in on the other side, runs under the floor of the lake. And now here we are on the opposite side. Yeah. I wonder if we could get some of them big leaves out down at the water's edge. I wonder if we can get them. Well, then let's wait. See my sandals on the dry land. Yes, that is good. Now then. Boy, it sure is a sky full of stars and a big moon to die. See out here almost like girly daylight. Yes, it is so beautiful. First time I've been on a midnight swimming party since I was knee high to a diaper. <laughs> okay, now. This ought to do. Yeah, these are swell. One of us can break a couple of them off. Cut fiber. Use my cut from my back and my fan spark on the other side of the lake. There. Oh, you're a strong man in the hands, Doc Ross. <laughs> you think so, huh? <laughs> now, this is all we need. This one reed's long enough to make three or four splints out of it. Well, come on, it's way back. Doc Ross? Yeah? This thing which you started to tell me about love. Yeah? Please tell me more. Now, look, you, honey, I reckon I've had too much already. Why do you think that? Well, the way Jeremiah lit into me, he didn't like the beer. Oh, Jeremiah is only Jeremiah. Sure, <sighs> yeah, that was a nice way. Yeah, now, where did I leave my sandals? Yeah. Yeah. This love at first sight that you talked about. Honey, when you get old enough and mature enough for such things, you ain't gonna have to be told. Wasn't you the one that's given Jack and me the song and dance about nobody being able to teach anybody anything? Oh, yes. Yeah. One must learn of his own permission. Well, that's how it is about girl and boy love. Nobody can tell you about it. You open your heart and he opens his heart, and first thing you know, you're both up to your armpits and Cupid's arrows, and here comes the bride. <laughs> you are wonderful, Dr. Ross. No kidding. Yes. I do not know half what you talk about, but just the same, you are wonderful, I think. The further adventures of Jack and Doc will come to you tomorrow at the same hour when you hear Jack say, You mean we've got another test to go through? Yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, what's this one going to be like? The next test will be to cross the lake of darkness.